be a big welcome uh, to uh, to Dilana, to Dilana Krasner. And uh, Dilana is from uh, Fontes University of Applied Sciences. And today we'll be talking about sex positive education for people with learning uh, disabilities. So uh, over to you, Dilana. Yes, thank you. So I'm going to start my presentation right now. It will take me a few seconds. Uh, da, da, da. Just going to install. OK, so now I've so I see a few of you, so that's really nice. It feels like I'm not talking to an empty screen, so that's really, uh, really good. Um, so happy to be here and uh, what how nice of uh, you to all show up. Uh, it's uh, six in the evening here. I think it's uh, five there, so uh, it's not that different. Um, so that's nice. Um, so I um, I would like to talk to you about sex positive education for people with learning disabilities. Um, excuse me if I say intellectual disabilities because I think it's learning disabilities in the UK and intellectual disabilities in the rest of the world. So I might uh, confuse those things. So uh, I apologize in advance. So um, I work as a researcher at Fontes University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands. And I've been working on this re research topic uh, for about well, almost 13 years, I think. Um, and for the rest, I'm also um, interested in uh, people with a uh, sexuality and people with a visual impairment, uh, also cultural diversity and sex education. Um, and I'm also working on well, trying to find out um, where the men are. Well, I see a few uh, men here uh, being present here, but we see that sex education uh, is done mostly by women in, in the field. So um, and, and I asked myself, like, why? So why is it a is it a female thing? I don't know. So I'm interested in that as well. So um, let me continue to next slide. Um, before I want to um, talk about the the what, what we know about the current state of sex education and, and my thoughts on that, um, I want to go back to the basics. So why sex education? I mean, if there's nothing wrong, if everything goes fine, then there's no need for sex education. So there, there's a reason why we are talking about it today. So I just want to go back to the basics first. Because sex is complex, so sex education is complex as well. So I want to dive a little bit in into the complexity of it before we go any further. And um, also, I want to provide some uh, definitions and guidelines because I talk about sexual sexuality. We all have different ideas and different concepts related to this word, this 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 construct. And I um, want to have a little bit of common language so that we know what we talk about. Um, and they are very helpful to me. And I find it that it's very helpful to um, other professionals and students as well when I present these guidelines. Um, and I hope that at the end of this lecture, um, I have inspired you to think about the content and maybe do something with it. So um, that's my aim. I hope you learn something new and um, go back home or wake up tomorrow and be like, I need to do something about this. I want to do do something. So that's the idea. Also, um, I apologize for for sometimes for my English. I'm not used to talking English all day, so sometimes I struggle with some translations in my head. And maybe I use the wrong word, but I'm Dutch. I'm not English, so. Um, so let's start with, oh, yep. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, of course, and, and then it will translate to opportunities. I forgot this one. So why, why sex education? So uh, when I'm working on this topic, I always have the concept of quality of life in, 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 in the back of my head. So um, I'm, these people logging in, driving me crazy. <laughs> Um, people keep on coming. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, we cannot turn it off, but it's okay. Um, 
so the idea uh, sex education is basically a behavior change intervention. We want to change something. We do. We provide sex education because we want to change something and we want to add to quality of life. I'm not saying that sex education always does that, but in, in uh, where I come from, that's the idea. We teach people about sex, sexuality and all its related uh, concepts because we want to improve quality of life. We want to improve sexual health. That's the idea. Uh, and when it comes to quality of life, it's about what in life gives us pleasure or satisfaction. So when you talk about sexuality and if you think about your own life and what gives you pleasure and what gives you satisfaction, uh, for me, it's the relationships I have with other people. It's the friendships. It's also the relationships with colleagues or family members. And of course, it's also romantic relationships and sexual pleasure I have in, in, in my romantic relationships. Uh, and for some people, it's also starting a family, for example. Um, I myself, I don't have children and I wa don't want children. But for some people, that's a goal in life that gives gives a person satisfaction, life satisfaction. And so these are important things for our quality of life that are related to sexuality. So the idea, of course, is that sex education um, is about these concepts as well, or should be about these concepts, but they're not always about these concepts. So this that's one thing I want to talk about, because what we see is some, I call it threats, but maybe you can call it some um, uh, downside or room for improvements. But currently, some of the things you see is that um, sex education is not about sexual pleasure or the relationships with others and, and relationship satisfaction, but it's um, more risk oriented, um, geared towards not getting pregnant, not getting STIs, um, and also uh, sexual abuse prevention, which are important elements, but they are just, I think, part of the story. If you think about quality of life and improving quality of life. Also, what you see is um, a lot of gender based uh, uh, messages. So women get different messages when it comes to sexuality than the men. There are uh, double standards in, 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 in sexuality. Um, for example, women should be sexy but not have sex. Women don't masturbate, they don't watch porn and that kind of stuff or should not do that and et cetera, et cetera. I have an opinion on that. Um, so yeah, the taboo on, on sexual pleasure and especially for women. And um, one of the things with sex education as well is that the informal sources so parents uh, and professionals also lack proper information themselves. It's a sort of vicious circle. They haven't been taught and in my opinion, the right things, so they don't teach others as well. So there are some issues here, and these are some of them, but I will mention a few more. But for me, sex education is about behavior change, and it's about giving or helping our people have meaningful relationships and have sexual pleasure. And that's what it should be about. And I don't think that's where we are at yet. So, it's just a little picture here. Um, so this is how I see things right now. Um, we, did, we do get a sort of form of sex education. We get messages in the form of TV shows, of social media, of other people's opinions, um, other kinds of media, uh, what friends think. So, as People, we get all kinds of messages about how we should behave, what we should think, what we should do, what we should feel. Um, so that's that's a form of sort of uh, sex education, but not formal sex education. And then you have the teacher with a little umbrella representing formal sex education and accurate knowledge. And they have to battle this wave of all kinds of information and messages people pick up in daily life. And that's a lot to handle. 
Um, I've had in, in the past many people say, no, schools should, sh schools should teach sex education. No, parents should do it. No, they should do it. Um, we, should, we should all do it because we have this wave of information coming at us and it's our task to provide proper sex education. So this is basically what we're up against and I think we all should be doing something about it and providing accurate information and not just one time what usually happens in school but this should, should be a continuous uh, thing because this wave will get and will keep coming and the messages um, men and women get will keep coming so there there's a task for us and um now I come to the, a little bit the more boring part of my uh, presentation, and that's like the guidelines and the definitions. I think as uh, professionals, we need these guidelines. We need a sort of uh, basis for what we are doing. And what's hel helpful for me are the definitions uh, by, the, by the World Health Organization. So I usually refer to this one. It provides some definitions about sexual health and, and uh, sex education. And I will show some of these, um, hopefully also helpful using in, in, in your work and in, in your organization. So um, when we talk about sexual health, I find this a very helpful definition. And I will just read it. Like I said, this is the boring part, but we will discuss it. So. It says sexual health is a state of physical, emotional, mental, and social well-being in relation to sexuality. And it's not merely the absence of disease, dysfunction, on, or infirmity. And if we look at most sex education that is taught, it's about preventing disease and, 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 and physical uh, um, yeah, unwell-being, but uh, um, and, and not the emotional uh, and mental stuff. Sexual health requires a positive and respectful approach to sexuality and sexual relationships, as well as the possibility of having pleasurable and safe sexual experiences, free of coercion, discrimination, and violence. So it explicitly talks about pleasurable experiences as well. And for sexual health to be maintained and maintain the sexual rights, I will get that in the next slide, of all persons must be respected, protected, and fulfilled. And especially when it comes to people with learning disabilities, we have a task here. Their sexual rights need to be fulfilled, fulfilled not only respected and protected. Um, so we need to do something about it. And what are these sexual rights? A right to the highest attainable standard of sexual health, including access to sexual and reproductive health and care services, seek, receive and impart information related to sexuality, sexuality education, respect for bodily, bodily integrity and choose their partner and also a right to decide to be sexually active or not, consensual sexual relations, consensual marriage, a right to decide whether or not and when to have children and to pursue a satisfying, safe and pleasurable sex life. So these are human rights, sexual rights. And maybe just all take a moment and ask yourself the question, are these rights fulfilled for most people and especially people with learning disabilities, are they? Because I think, I think not. I think we still have a lot to do here. And uh, some of these might be certain dilemmas, especially when it comes to like having children and stuff. But I think there's still a lot of room for improvement here. So keep in mind, these are sexual rights also for people with learning disabilities. And when we talk about sexual sexuality education, it means learning about the cognitive, emotional, social, interactive and physical aspects of sexuality and it starts in early childhood and what you see uh, at the moment most people think sex education should be provided when children are about the age of 12 or 13 which is not true it's too late um, so it starts in early childhood and progresses through adolescence and adulthood 
for children and young people. It aims at supporting and protecting sexual de development. So supporting it as well. It gradually equips and empowers children and young people with information, skills and positive values to understand and enjoy their sexuality, have safe and fulfilling relationships and take responsibility for their own and other people's sexual health and well-being. And it enables them to make choices which enhance the equality of their lives, uh, the quality of their lives. So again, quality of life uh, comes into play here and contribute to a compassionate and just society. I still don't really have a good idea about the last part, but we, we can discuss that. Maybe you have an idea about that. Um, and all children and young people have the right to have access to age appropriate sexuality education. For every age, there's a age appropriate education. So in summary, um, a little bit the principle. So we're talking about holistic uh, sex education uh, here. And I think in, in general, the sex education that is provided is not very holistic. It's more geared to the risk oriented geared towards safe sex. And at the age 12, 13, we have the talk. But holistic sex education, it starts at birth. Uh, is of age appropriate. So for every age, there are messages and things to learn based on human rights approach or the sexual rights and uh, the holistic concept of well-being. It's not only about health, but also uh, uh, mental and, and, and um, social well-being based on gender equality, self-determination de self and diversity. Um, I think we still have a lot to do if it comes to gender equality and contribution to fair and compassionate society. Again, I find this concept a bit fake. Um, and of course, scientifically accurate information. So this was a little bit more boring part of my uh, presentation, but I hope it gives you some ideas of what I think it should be about and it will help you in your work as well. So like I said, um, sex and therefore sex education is complex and I already provided some complexity in some of these definitions but I'm going a little bit further. Um, what I see uh, when it comes to sex education it's usually geared towards a person with learning disabilities and we probably, um, mostly provide some information so some knowledge. Uh, sometimes we also practice skills and we work on attitudes but those are things that are more difficult to change. Um, and that's our focus. But if we really want to change, if we really want to help people with learning disabilities, we have to look at it in a more, in a broader setting, basically. So that's what I try to do here. So here you have the person with a learning disability, or you can just look at yourselves. I mean, this is also applicable to ourselves. So we have knowledge, we have skills, we have attitudes, we have those things uh, that will lead to our behavior. So in order to have sexual pleasure, we need certain knowledge, we need certain skills, and we need, of course, certain attitude as well. This is simplified, of course. Um, but our behavior and our ability and our cap and, and, and possibilities to have sexual pleasure um, and to have opportunities uh, to meet other people, for example, it is influenced by people in our environment. It's, in, in, it's influenced by our family. It's influenced by, uh, for example, professionals. It's uh, influenced by teachers, um, uh, especially with people with learning disabilities due to the dependence, um, these people have a huge influence on whether a person with a learning disability has the ability to experience sexual pleasure. But professionals, for example, are also influenced by organization policy. Is the organization policy positive towards providing sex positive education, yes or no? Are there uh, materials that are available, yes or no? Um, and of course, policy in organizations is also influenced by policy on a higher level, uh, but it's also influenced by society in general. 
all these layers influence each other. And if you really want to make a change, you should also consider these different layers and consider how they influence the person with a learning disability in the end. Um, so when you talk about behavior change, you should also consider these different levels. And that's what it makes it complex. And that's why it uh, usually is not enough to just provide a person with some knowledge and you think, well, problem solved. It doesn't work like that. It's more complex. I don't have an answer for everything, but I hope I'll give you some ideas of what you can do or what needs to be done. So if you look at these um, different layers, um, what do we see with people with learning disabilities? So I, yeah, I say problems because I don't know if everything is really a problem for the person itself. Um, but what I, I like to distinguish certain areas. So one area is relationships, problems in finding, forming and maintaining relationships. Um, I put them together now, but of course finding a relationships takes different kinds of knowledge, skills, attitudes, support, then forming or maintaining a relationship. So that's complex on its own. Um, then we have ne negative sexual e experiences. It can, of course, sexual abuse. And we know that people with, with a learning disability uh, have a higher risk on experiencing sexual abuse but also other kinds of negative experiences. For example, experience with dating online, that kind of thing. Um, of course, also the, the classic uh, uh, unplanned pregnancy. I put unplanned be between brackets because sometimes people do want to get pregnant. It's not unplanned, but it's usually people in the environment don't want them to get pregnant. So that's a, a different kind of problem. Um, and of course, problem of STIs and stuff. And then we have parenthood. Um, I'm not the biggest expert on the parenthood part. There are other people who know more about it, but I know that it's a big issue and mainly by people in the environment. They are scared. People get pregnant, have children, etc. But the thing is, it's sexual rights. So that's that's a real dilemma there. So this is more on, on the, the, the problems and um, what we see uh, that influences these problems. I usually uh, divide them in two different categories, like unchangeable things, such as the learning disability itself, or had the difference between um, uh, their calendar age and their social emotional level. Um, the matryoshkas, the little uh, picture there, represent calendar age, cognitive ability, and social emotional level that they are different. And in sex education, that you have to keep in mind that um, there is this difference. So a 16 year old might have social emotional level of a six year old, and you have to keep that in mind when you provide sex education. I found it a nice visual. I stole that of somebody else. And um, and then there are the changeable factors. So we know that people with learning disabilities have less knowledge about all kinds of topics concerning relationships, concerning sex, child rearing, contraception. They have uh, limited skills. Of course, it's also due, due to learning disability. But this I always find interesting. I feel that the moment you have a learning disability, you have like a double disability because people behave differently towards you because you have a disability and they talk less about subjects concerning sexuality and therefore um, you have it's kind of in an, in an unnecessary way have less knowledge than peers because it's discussed less so it's i always find it a sort of double disability and also with skills because you, I'll, I'll get to it in the next slide as well, but because you have a learning disability, people provide less opportunities for you to practice, and then you sort of get an extra disability. Oh, well, that's just, um, just a, a thought I have. Um, and negative attitudes. So if you're taught your whole life that you should not have sex, sex is wrong, sex is dirty, and then all these messages from society, especially if you're a woman, 
um, that say women um, should not watch porn and should not masturbate and all that kind of stuff, then you probably have an, a negative attitude towards certain things as well. And that doesn't help either if it comes to sexual pleasure. So these are, of course, this is oversimplified, but these are some of the ex aspects um, but that we can change if, if, we, um, if you want to. And then there are the environmental factors. So just the fact that people don't discuss the topic, so there is no sex education or um, people talk about it when something happens, which so in a reactive way, not in a proactive way. So people wait till there is a question or there is a situation, which is what people usually do. But when we talk about providing age appropriate messages um, from an early age, well, it doesn't compute, also usually risk oriented. Then we have the dependence, we already talked about it, the dependence of uh, proper information from people in the environment, also conservative attitudes, rules and restrictions, usually because of protection. So we want to protect, and that's why uh, sometimes rules and restrictions are put in there. And um, also uh, a lack of opportunities to experiment. I just had a, um, I'll talk about it later as well, but I just gave a team training. And when talking about sexual pleasure and privacy and opportunities, one of the conclusions they made was that um, the rooms were too loud, like the walls were too thin. So basically their um, the sex in a room would bother the neighbor. So just the fact that they didn't think about privacy and stuff in building the rooms is can be a barrier, s stuff like that. Okay, just, just a random thought. Um, so I was talking about those uh, rules and restrictions, and I think this is, this is a real dilemma that, that keeps popping up. Like the, the, the balance between do I provide a certain freedom, autonomy, um, or do I protect? And this is what keeps popping up. And what I think now is that most professionals and parents are trying to protect, which makes sense because, of course, sexual abuse is a real thing. But by protecting them, you do not provide opportunities to learn how to form meaningful relationships or to experience sexual pleasure. So in the short term, you might be protecting people from negative experiences, but in the long term, you're not adding and not helping when it comes to quality of life. And this is, I think, a real thing in, in the field. So and right now, I think most of the people have like their protection goggles, safety goggles on. And um, I would uh, think there's more a need to put the rose colored glasses on and to look at it that way. To use an, 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 another metaphor, I think it's our task to help people to climb up in a tree without them breaking their necks. It's okay if they fall out and they scrape their knee, um, but we want to prevent real trauma. We cannot expect children to just stay on the ground once we turn around. We cannot, and we cannot watch them all the time. So what we want to do, what we need to do, um, is guide them up the tree and help them to do that properly and to learn how to climb a tree properly. And that's the same with sexuality. We have a task to help and support people with learning disabilities to, to, to experience sexuality in a, a positive way. And sometimes they might have negative experiences because we all have, but we want to prevent real trauma in that area as much as we can. But we need to provide some freedom and some opportunities to experiment and to have experiences. So I've always find this a nice metaphor. So, um, and, and, and this, so the, the balance between 
uh, the, the risks and uh, so the freedom and protection uh, is an important point. And talking about sexual pleasure and focusing on sexual pleasure and not only protection is an important one. Um, so a couple of years ago, I developed a team training with two organizations. Uh, unfortunately, due to, due to Corona, I've only put it into practice uh, once. But the idea is um, not to teach individual professionals, give them knowledge about sexual development and how they need to talk about sexuality, et cetera, et cetera, because that's more focused on the individual. But like I said, the environment has a huge influence. So team culture has a huge influence on uh, whether a person with a learning disability receives sex education or not. And there are already e-learnings and workshops that focus on knowledge and skills of the individual. So we wanted to do something about the team culture. Um, so this, this training is about, first of all, uh, what, are, what are the policies within this organization? And a lot of organizations do incorporate sexual rights into their uh, policy. So we discussed that because those are the professional guidelines they need to adhere to. And then we just talk about what do you wish for your clients? What do you want them to achieve? And of course, me as a, um, a trainer, uh, we'll be talking about meaningful relationships and sexual pleasure because I hope that everybody wishes sexual pleasure and meaningful relationships for somebody. And then we talk about how does it translate to your behavior as professional? How do you make sure that you get as far as you can uh, to that place for your clients? And um, and only after that, if they have an idea, this is what we stand for as a team. This is what we want to achieve. And these are the things we need to do. Then we talk about, OK, what skills do you already have? Do you need support? Do you maybe need a little bit more education on certain subjects? Um, so that's what we do in a team training. And, and we hope uh, that uh, having them talk about it and discuss these things that they are more inclined to teach sex education in a proactive way, not in a reactive way. And then they think about it. Because we also found out that one of the important things or um, if, you, if you want professionals to provide sex education, is that they talk about it with colleagues as well. It's a very important factor. If they also know that colleagues find it important that they teach sex education, the chances um, are higher um, that they that they do. So just this is just a thing I'm working on currently, but we don't know if it works yet. But this is the idea. Um, other environmental factors, so uh, for example, fix facilities in 2017, I did a small study, it's not published. That's why I added um, um, the work of uh, Michelle McCarthy and colleagues, and I know that maybe some of the authors are present here, uh, added that one. But this, the, I think the results are similar. So I was curious to see uh, what specialized dating agencies for people with learning disabilities did, uh, what kind of members they have, uh, what kind of support they provided, etc. And also here um, we found some issues. So for example, we've, the, the, most of them, uh, of most of the members were men. So 67 to 82 percent. I think there were like six, date, six dating agencies. And some of them don't even exist anymore because they were struggling with finances, because people with learning disabilities have a high support needs, but not a lot of money to spend. So people basically want to use it for free, but also want and need support that does not compute. OK, so that's a problem. Uh, most of them do do a check on learn uh, whether a person has learning disabilities, but some don't. So there's a safety issue there. Um, the coverage of members. So some people live in rural areas and usually relationships all succeed when people live close by. And if they don't, that's a problem. Unrealistic expectations. I remember having a conversation with a young man and he said to me, 
uh, that he uh, just became member of a dating agency and he still did not have a girlfriend. So um, I was like, yeah, it's not how it works, but apparently nobody talked to you about that yet. So uh, uh, managing expectations is an important job. Uh, only a few LGBT members, so if it comes to coverage, that's a problem as well. And that men seem to have different needs than women. So men want, so in, in short, men want to have sex and women want to have friends. Uh, also, I wonder if this is a society thing, all the messages, the gender-based messages we get from society, of course, also has an influence here. But the, the fact is that at this moment, the, the needs and, and the wishes are different. And I think there are similar, there were similar results in the study uh, done by uh, Michelle McCarthy and colleagues. And coming back to the struggle with finances, so there were like six or seven uh, uh, dating agencies back then. I think there are maybe two or three left right now. And there's one uh, organization who uh, gets org organizations to pay for the membership to try and, and, and do something about those finances. So it's a different uh, uh, setup, basically. And I think that's the way to go, that organizations pay for their clients and not themselves, because yeah, they don't have a lot of money, usually. Um, and also the sex education materials. I did a research already years ago, but um, I think it's still uh, relevant. So um, if we want to provide proper sex education, it's useful if there are proper materials as well. And back then I found, especially in the international literature, that we don't know a lot about what works for people with learning disabilities because most of the content of uh, the education materials was one big black box. So what is taught and how it is taught was not the focus of the studies. Uh, goals of these materials were very broad, like we want to increase knowledge. Um, just increasing sexual knowledge randomly doesn't change anything. You really need to know what does a person need to know in order to form meaningful relationships or have sexual pleasure. Uh, and most studies focused on increasing knowledge. While that's the easiest part, the most difficult part is skills and supporting people to practice those skills. That's like the in situ, in situ learning. So in learning in the situation itself is most effective, but it's also very difficult to achieve. Um, and I, I look back at it, but I don't think any of those materials were about sexual pleasure. A lot of things were about preventing sexual abuse or uh, increasing uh, self-protection skills, stuff like that. Maybe things have changed in the last six years, but I, I don't think so. So yeah, we're getting to the opportunities. So this was very brief. I just picked out some of the stuff I've been thinking about. I've been researching um, um, and I've been frustrated about maybe. And um, I think we still have a lot to do. So um, I think on an individual level, so for people learning disabilities, I think we need to talk more and do more, not only talk, not only provide information, but do more about the relationships part, about helping people finding a relationship, practicing with it, forming a relationship, and also maintaining a relationship. Um, I know now with the dating agencies, there's more attention, focus on finding a relationship. But I've talked to uh, people here in the Netherlands and there are not many people who are specialized in supporting people maintaining relationships or relationship therapists for people with a learning disability. There are not many of them, but I think it's very important. Um, so there's stuff to do there. And, 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 and talk about sexual pleasure. Um, talk about masturbation with both men and women. Um, I find it very sad when I hear that a woman has penetration sex before they even had an orgasm by masturbating. I think that's really sad. So we have something to do there. Um, 
sex with a partner, having pleasurable sex with a partner, of course. And um, I just gave an example. Um, a lot of people think sex equals penetration sex. So penis and a vagina, which is not true. Sex is much more than that. Um, so talk about that and how to do that and not have that focus pure on penetration sex. And also have a discussion about sex toys. Um, I, I mentioned the teen training. And uh, one thing I found interesting was that at a certain moment, um, somebody said, well, maybe we can uh, provide sex toys as an alternative. Now, I know this person very well, and I know she's very open about sexuality and very pro sexual pleasure, but it was a sort of unconscious remark. And I asked her, why would you not provide sex toys as a standard? So I have the conversation about it, you know, always with people like if they uh, want to have a sex toy or look up sex toys and see what's uh, fitting for them. Why would it be an alternative and an alternative to what if sex with another person doesn't work or they cannot find a partner or if they have problems masturbating? Why not standard? So that's one thing I was thinking about. Why don't we have a standard conversation about that? Um, and I, I just wanted to present uh, some materials that are pretty new. Um, these are actually only available from this week in the Netherlands. It's in Dutch, I'm sorry, it's not in English. But it gives an, a little bit of an idea what's going on in the Netherlands. So this is a very new method to talk about relationships, to talk about where, uh, what kind of steps you need to take, what you can expect for your first date or what you want on your first date, what kind of sexual behaviors you're familiar with and maybe what you have done and you want to do or don't want to do, but it provides cards with all kinds of behaviors and you can have the conversation about it. And I just wanted to show some of these pictures because the, the text is in Dutch. So for example, here are some behaviors that can be in a relationship so um, asking somebody to be their girlfriend or boyfriend or asking for a phone number, going on a date, uh, chatting with each other through mobile telephone and all these kinds of behaviors that, uh, that you do within a relationship. And then there are also cards that show explicit sexual behaviors and you can just discuss it like, have you ever done this? Do you want to do this? Do you know what it is? Um, and also, uh, that's why I put it in there, also about sex toys, for example. And um, yeah, you can have all kinds of conversations about these behaviors in different phases of the relationship. So that's a little bit uh, uh, the idea. So this is quite new. Um, just looking at the time. Um, I'm almost finished. So opportunities more on an environmental level because I know I was talking about uh, people with learning disabilities themselves, but what should the environment do in my opinion? So first of all, uh, teach sex education, sex positive education in a more proactive way. Start at a young age and provide age appropriate information and think about it. Think about it explicitly and, and do something about that. Um, I also put in there discussing team values. That's more like discuss with your team. What do we stand for? What do we want to achieve in the area of sexuality? Um, I'm assuming everybody wants their clients to have meaningful relationships. Do your clients now have meaningful relationships? Or are they lonely? Do they want a romantic partner? Uh, do they have opportunities to find a romantic partner or should we support them in, in a certain way? So create opportunities. Think about creating them because this is this is one thing I continuously got in conversations I had with people with learning disabilities. Like where do I meet people? I don't know. Help me. Um, so for example, using dating agencies could be could be an option but also a club or go to a cafe or 
whatever. And sometimes it's as simple as helping people making appointments with other people if they find that difficult. It can be that simple and bring them to a date. Um, so that, yeah, that was a little bit it, what I wanted to uh, uh, say in these 45 minutes, because give me three hours and I will talk about it three hours. And I just put in here some stuff for further reading. And you probably have some questions, I hope so. Thank you, Delana. Um, yes, there's certainly some questions uh, in the chat. And, um, I I think I'm going to try and uh, so people have been asking if we could please have the um, the PowerPoints if that's OK. Yep. Yes. And then if I, um, stop uh, sharing or. Yeah, you could stop sharing if you would like. Um, but so so if you pass them on to me, then I can email yep. uh, everyone in the group. And yep. um, OK, lovely. So I think that we've got a couple of questions and uh, Andrea is saying uh, can you comment on the impact of capacity assessments relating to decisions about engaging in sexual relationships and use of uh, contraceptive? What? Sorry, <laughs> I, I don't know if you have access on the on the text. Um, if Andrea, would you like to? Wow, that's that's like a complex question. Um... So the impact of capacity assessments relating to decisions about um, engaging in sexual relationships and people using contraceptives. So, um, wow, not my expertise. <laughs> um, there are probably people present here that have much more expertise about that subject than I do. Um, very, very, um, so basically, so uh, how do you assess capacity for forming relationships and also contraceptive use, right? So like that's the summary of the question, if I'm correct. Um, sorry, Andrea. Um, oh, I see a question here. Uh, impact capacity assessments. I'm not very familiar what kind of capacity assessments there are or what kind of capacity assessments there are in the UK. Um, I'm kind of scared of trying to answer this question, so I'd like to pass this on to people who are much more familiar with capacity assessments. I'm sorry. OK, I think that's that's OK. And probably I think that yeah. someone has got um, two people have got there. We've got some hands being raised, so if people would like to speak up. No, I just wanted I'm Carolina. Um, I just wanted to help you because it's very uh, England specific law, Mental Capacity Act. So probably most of European people won't be able to help uh, with answer. Um, I'm qualified in Poland and we don't really have, we have different law. European law is different and doesn't reflect English law. So it's England, Great Britain specific. Yeah. And at plus, plus I'm I'm um, I'm a researcher and I'm not a practitioner, so I don't deal with these kinds of decisions on a daily basis. So normally I would uh, pass this question on to uh, colleagues who actually um, uh, are practitioners uh, and work in the field. So I think that's fair enough, um, Lana. La Lana, you wanted to you had a comment or you had your hand up? Yeah, thank you. I've really enjoyed listening to you speaking. I'm, I'm just really interested about what will you do about parents of people? Because I can imagine, well, I know when I've been in situations, um, you know, these young people, their parents don't like the idea of their children having sexual relationships or any kind of dating situations. And I can imagine it being quite a barrier to it's almost going to be awkward to be having those conversations with the parents to then be having the conversations with the people that you're supporting and I think that's going to be really hard and it's I was also thinking from what you were saying it's it's quite a big change in a support worker's role to get them talking about things that might make them uncomfortable or um you know so I think you've got two really huge barriers of what you're trying to achieve yeah um 
you, you know, and I, I don't know from what you were saying, you, you, you talked about doing training with the staff, but yep. I, I can't see how, how this is going to positively go into practice in an easy way. I, I think it's going to be a real struggle. Yes, behavior change is difficult. And um, the team training I did was with a team that were already open about sexuality. So I'm looking forward to have a more difficult team. But this is the thing. I start with the question, what do you wish for your clients? And you can ask parents the same thing, of course. What do you wish for your child? And I hope that parents will also say meaningful relationships and positive sexual experiences. Not necessarily maybe with somebody else, but you can also start with their own body and and their own experiences and having sexual pleasure with themselves. Well, I like that idea from what you were saying. I like the idea of providing sex toys in, you know, in homes or supported living. I thought that was uh, a first step that's achievable. But it's it's difficult and it's because, like I said, in, in the informal sources, parents and professionals have not had a proper proper conversation about this as well. So it's new for them and then they have to teach uh, others. That's also what I am, um, oh, for example, with my students, I usually first start with their own sexuality and I also tell them, I need to give you sex education first before we talk about you providing sex education to others. And I, I know we're lacking in like huge ways when it comes to uh, sex education in general. So it's it's really difficult, but we need to start somewhere. Uh, so it's I think it's small changes. We have like an idealistic sort of end goal, uh, but I realize that if we can start the conversation about providing people with opportunities to have meaningful relationships and more relationships with people like themselves, because if you look at the social network of people, it's usually family and professionals. But look at your own life. Yeah. Huh? It's very small, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So maybe start with that, like uh, extending friendships. And maybe there's somebody they like more than just friends, but provide those opportunities. And sometimes people just see the same people day in, day out, and they never meet new people. So let's start with that. Yeah, I think that's important as well. Alison, um, we have another another question. Hi, yeah. I, I work, thank you for that. That was really interesting. I, I work with students with very significant learning disabilities and language difficulties. So having a conversation is very difficult. It's in, in the education system, so um, it does go up to 19, but most of the pupils are younger. And we often are posed with a problem where children um, find their private parts and start masturbating, but they don't understand that it has to happen in a private location. So one has to educate them on that. How do you educate them on that in a um, way that won't discourage them in, in their future to carry on exploring themselves, but in a, a private setting is one question. And the other question, someone that hasn't discovered that, it's very difficult to teach them that because they only learn through experience. Exactly. Um, the first question I would probably also pass to, on to people who actually do this kind of thing in practice, like teach, teach. Um, so maybe there are also people at present who have more experience with talking uh, to people, you know, about privacy or, or learning that without um, giving the message that it's a bad thing. Um, but what I do, um, usually this, this, this sounds simple and probably won't always work, but not talk about what you can do, but teach them what they can do and where they can do it. So not focus on the not part, but what they can do part, but it doesn't always work as well. So anybody else here has real experiences in this part, please speak up. And the second part was about, sorry, I forgot it. It was if you work with um, students that um, only learn through experience because of their level of learning right. disabilities, how does that work? This is an interesting, um, I'm, I'm currently we are trying to get money for a project on people with a visual, visual impairment because they cannot learn from pictures. And I'm, I'm really, th and, and, and there's 
currently no tactile material. Well, there is um, um, Magali Piro. She has the website positivesexad.org, and she actually has uh, makes uh, silicon versions of penises and vulvas, real ones. Um, and this is just an idea that pops up in my mind that people can experience by feeling this kind of material. So realistic vulvas and penises maybe. Maybe that will help also discovering their own body. But again, I'm not sure, but that's what, one thing that pops up into my mind that we need more tactile materials as well in our education and not just pictures. But yeah, it's just what I'm thinking. I don't have Thank to you. Thank you. What was the name of the website? Positive sex at dot org. Yeah. And her name is Magali Piro and you can order um, stuff there as well. Also a really nice model with a clitoris in it. It's really cool. All right, thank you for that. And um, we've got some more questions in the chat. I don't know, uh, probably we don't have enough time for them all, but I could see um, Vasiliki, you had your hand up. Perhaps you would like to ask your question or you're on mute. Sorry, I was looking for uh, the mute. So uh, basically, I wanted to say about um, earlier about the question uh, about uh, how to teach better to uh, not masturbate in a public space, but in a private space. Um, I wanted to say uh, social stories are a good way, but um, yeah, that's it. You said social stories? Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, it's a good way to help guide people, especially with uh, visual prompts, especially if they have difficulties with um, spoken language. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, jo, uh, you, you also had your hand up. I think that's the last one for today. Hey, uh, sorry, just to follow on from that, we're teaching about only masturbating in private. Um, the PEX company do a programme called So Safe that teach in a really nice systematic way places that are public behave or private, behaviours that are public or private, and it's and then teaches steps to relationships. And we use it with our kind of kids. Um, I really like it. I don't know if it's helpful for anyone. Thank you. That sounds really good. It's really good. Thank you. There, there were some more questions, so probably what I might uh, have to do, Delane, is to pass the comments on, or if you can have a look at the comments perhaps afterwards. I'm just aware of the time, but it's past six o'clock now. Um, I don't have problems with an extra 10 minutes. It's not a problem for me, but... OK. Um, I think it might be better um, to, to, to discuss this at another, like I can pass you on the comments and you can reply them uh, in private. Um, so at that point, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for, for joining us. And um, I, thank you, thank you, uh, Delana, for, for being here today. It's really, it's such a good thing. I think within all this COVID situation, horrible situation, we've had the opportunity to actually invite people that we wouldn't be able to invite otherwise. So thank you so much for that. And thank you, uh, yeah, Th thank you everyone and see you for the next one. <laughs>